Hello, a warm spring welcome to all Minnesotans and friends from afar to the Walleye Tank COVID-19 Showcase. The birds are singing, the trees and flowers are blooming, and innovators across our great state are bringing their best science, engineering, and business skills to life so that we can all see our loved ones as soon as possible. I'm Mary McCarthy from the University of Minnesota's Technology Commercialization Office and Venture Center. Our office is empowered by the regions to protect and commercialize intellectual property developed anywhere in the U of M system. We market the used intellectual property, negotiate licenses to existing companies and help launch startups. This year we've launched 17 so far. The planning team for this event includes Dr. Stephen Ecker and Dr. Stefan Manit Singh from the Mayo Clinic's Office of Entrepreneurship and my rock star colleague, Laura Johnson. Shout out to our AV wizard, David Lindemann, who is working behind the scenes to support us and the YouTube stream. As of today, according to the Minnesota Department of Health, 14,240 Minnesotans, including 1,702 healthcare workers have tested positive for COVID-19. The innovators we're showcasing today are applying all their education, experience and persistence to boldly conquer this virus. The walleye tank started five years ago as a collaboration between Mayo and the University of Minnesota, and this is the eighth event. Until today, the walleye tank was a startup pitch competition, but like startups do, we pivoted to meet the needs of the community. This particular event is simply a showcase of storytellers engaging each of you in your homes, whether it's your living room, kitchen, spare bedroom, basement office, or your patio deck. Uh, we've got a few uh, sponsors on technology commercialization, but Mayo Clinic has been involved, the Home Center for Entrepreneurship, the University of Minnesota Medical School, Medical Alley, Launch Minnesota, and the new Venture Builders. Today's lineup starts with opening comments from Dr. Jacob Tolar from the U's Medical School and our friend Deed Commissioner Steve Grove. Art Erdman from the Earl E. Bakken Medical Devices Center will talk about the birth of Coventer and Medical Alley's Frank Jaskolke will address how they're supporting healthcare innovation across Minnesota. There's so much innovation happening to combat COVID-19 that we received 32 strong applications to present. So you'll only hear a, a small sample of great work from across the state. Stories will be about genomics research, food distribution, testing, personal protection equipment, software, transportation, and even Minnesota's first and only prescription medication repository, which is launching in a week. The 15 startups, whether they're nonprofit or for-profit, will be asking for help in some way. We invite you to help them make the biggest possible impact with their innovation. Now I'm proud to introduce our first innovator, Dr. Jacob Tolar. Uh, Dr. Tolar is Dean of the University of Minnesota's Medical School and Vice President of Clinical Affairs, co-leader of um Health Fairview and board chair of Minnesota, of University of Minnesota Physicians. Dean Tolar will be sharing his perspective on the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for innovation in healthcare. Dr. Tolar. Okay, thank you, Mary. It is, uh, would you like to unmute? Okay, how about now? Thank you, Mary. I, I take it that I am visible to you and uh, you can hear me now. Um, it's very kind of you to talk uh, through my titles, but it always feels like you are talking about somebody else. Uh, the more important part of why I'm here is that I have uh, known Steve Ecker for a very long time, and uh, I do have, as he does, a uh, basic science lab for the last 30 years or so, and I always try to bridge the 
innovation from that lab to clinic in my day job, which is the bone marrow transplant. I'd like to welcome everyone, of course, to, the, uh, to this event. And uh, I think that the start to the COVID-19 response should be from where science and technology has always been and uh, has been much more focused over the time of this COVID-19 epidemic. What I mean by that is the, uh, the science is the best way we understand the world around us. It is an uh, incredibly powerful way of uh, changing our lives personally and as a society. And uh, to my knowledge, there has been nothing better yet uh, discovered as a methodology of thinking and acting with uh, vigor and directionality in uh, our lives uh, and uh, navigating our society. So the COVID-19 epidemic has, uh, there's nothing so you know, unusual about epidemic. Epidemics have been with the mankind forever. What is, uh, important is that it elevates and surfaces some of the concepts that have been always present, but are no longer uh, possible to be ignored. And that's where the science and technology has been uh, so gloriously positioned because of this uh, circumstance. And uh, that is how I look at this as a, it's more like a Google Maps, you know where to go because Obviously, the virus is a minimalist and the virus is something that we as mankind are adapting to rather than guiding it, you know, where it goes. And in that way, we need some navigation because what's essential is invisible. It's a virus. Uh, but we have been fortunate to have so many organizations in our state that are motivated to respond uh, with scientific collaboration and uh, technological creativity. So what do we have in common here is the confidence in science, confidence in technology, confidence in ability to convert a retreat to advance and uh, convert the, uh, the even energetic passivity to agency that is so important for the land grant university, for the academic institutions such as, such as Mayo Clinic and University of Minnesota and uh, how to channel that enormous potential energy of the research and development at these institutions and many others in the state into the kinetic energy of action and actually getting things done. And so I'm so uh, gratified that there are so uh, uh, phenomenal examples coming up this afternoon to demonstrate that. So I'd like to thank the university's technology commercialization for their work on the event and uh, uh, obviously uh, University of Minnesota Medical School, uh, the Mayo Office for Entrepreneurship and the Gary S. Holmes Center for Entrepreneurship as well. So what really needs to happen is that we are going to use all this ingenuity to reshape for the new era of complexity and um, we will not uh, very intentionally and directly, we will not return to normalcy. Because if we were to do that, that'd be a failure to learn from this experience. What we will do is we will create a new uh, solidarity and new discipline and direction uh, under the leadership of the, uh, of the science and, uh, and the current of technology that runs through this. So thank you everyone. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Tolar. Thank you for your leadership and for supporting Walleye Tank and caring for all of us. We're also honored to have Minnesota Department of Economic of Employment and Economic Development Commissioner Steve Grove join us today. Thanks for taking a break from the uh, Capitol and TV crews and thanks for joining us today, Steve. Thanks, Mary. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Toller, for that uh, wonderful beginning and for all your hard work to improve the capacity of testing we have in the state to ensure that we can track this virus effectively. And thank you also to the Mayo Clinic Office for Entrepreneurship for your leadership here uh, for putting on Walleye Tank. I I'll say that, you know, most conference calls I'm joining these days are about trying to uh, mitigate the virus, um, manage uh, manage the, the business shutdowns we've had to engage in and talk a lot about kind of 
suppression of, of the disease and of business as we try to slow the spread. So it is nice to be joining uh, an event and a group of people who are um, having a different kind of conversation about how we can use Minnesota's great entrepreneurship, its technology, its startup community to tackle this virus as well. And I think I um, just want to commend the hosts of Walleye Tank for putting this event together. We are huge fans of it here at Deed. And I'm also thrilled to be joined by my colleague, Neil Mulgard, who you'll hear from a little bit later, who is the executive director of Launch Minnesota, which is our effort as state government to be a part of this whole startup ecosystem in this state and help elevate and support it through both uh, funding and, and convening and amplification of the great work that happens here in Minnesota. Um, you know, I will say it's obviously in our department uh, been a, a unique and unprecedented time as it has for everyone. And, you know, most of our efforts thus far have focused early on and making sure that we have the economic supports that Minnesotans need to get through this time, both in the form of unemployment insurance for workers who are dislocated from their jobs, but also small business supports for small businesses that need loans and grants and other uh, bridge mechanisms to get through this period of time that's tough. Um, but we're also spending a lot of time trying to get the economy back up and running in the safest way possible. And as you've seen, even just the past few days and certainly over the past few weeks, uh, the governor has made uh, some thoughtful and difficult decisions to begin to re-enter businesses into our economy in a safe and, and productive way um, with just a new normal being a part of how commerce happens, whether that involves social distancing, uh, health screening, um, capacity limits on, on how we engage in our economy, all these new uh, terminologies and new playbooks that we're all developing together to make sure that we can both have economic growth and also uh, keep our state safe. And I think part of what gives us and state government the confidence to, to do that and to move forward on, on growing the economy at a very difficult time is the innovators that we're joined by here today in this event. It is the fact that Minnesota has such an innovative startup culture that we have a real problem solving mentality to the kinds of companies that we create. Uh, and the places like uh, the U and, and Mayo and others are here to help support that startup ecosystem and help them help people take ideas and grow them into companies, grow them into viable businesses that can make our state great. And it's that kind of thing that I think about when I'm, you know, when I'm sitting and, and talking to small businesses and others and looking at how hard this is, it, it, it needs some inspiration to think about people like you, people like the innovators in our state, they're gonna chart the course forward for us uh, as a state and as a community. So I'm I'm thrilled to be a part of this and just to, to say um, thank you up top to, to you, to, to Mayo, to everybody who made this event possible, but most of all to the entrepreneurs and, and the innovators who are gonna build this new economy for us. And we all know that the economy that we are heading into both in the medium term and the long term is going to be very different than the one from which we came. And if we can make that economy in Minnesota more inclusive uh, more innovative uh, on the forefront of the new technologies we're going to need both to keep ourselves healthy, but also ensure that Minnesota creates uh, family sustaining jobs and wages and the new technologies that will build the, the new future our country needs, then we're going to be in very good shape. So thanks for having me. Best of luck with the event. Really, really proud to, for Launch Minnesota to be a part of this. Again, you'll hear more from my colleague, uh, Neil Mulgard later, but just uh, thrilled to be here in, in uh, be a part of this kickoff and I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Mary. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Steve. We support you too. Um, next up, we have a good friend of our office, uh, Art Erdman, director of the Earl E. Bakken Medical Devices Center here at the U. Art will be sharing the exciting Coventer story from idea to FDA approval to manufacturing and then next to commercialization in record time. Take it away, Art. Thanks very much. Uh, next slide, please. I'm really pleased to uh, be asked to make this presentation. Uh, thanks to Dean Tolar for an initiation grant that he gave to Dr. Stephen uh, Richardson. Um, and this is a, a story that I never thought I would tell uh, of collaboration between engineering and medicine in an amazing amount of time. Uh, the 15th of uh, March, which uh, was the day that uh, Steve went to MGC Diagnostics and made the first uh, ventilator, which you see in the picture there. Uh, the next day, Monday, I got an email at one in the morning from Steve saying, can we come by? We, we have some uh, help with that we need. It's it just totally amazing that in 30 days, uh, it went from uh, an idea to FDA approval. Next slide, please. 
Um, on the left, you can see a rendering that was made within days at the Bakken Medical Devices Center. On the right hand side is a typical breathing circuit, which includes an Ambu bag. And this device, which was described by one of our uh, company collaborators as a one arm robot, but it does the job of squeezing that bag, particularly in emergency situations. Next slide, please. So day one, Steve Richardson on the left, uh, Melissa um, came by with her colleagues interested in, uh, um, in motorizing the handheld ECMO unit, which uh, would double the amount of ECMO units uh, at the, uh, in, in the system. Um, we um, went off um, with full speed ahead and haven't really stopped since. Next slide. So here's Steve with the uh, ECMO unit in his hand and uh, the original uh, unit in the box that if, if you go to the Bakken Medical Devices Center website and see all sorts of uh, stories that have been told on it, this, including animations. Next slide, please. So um, we, we have uh, successful testing done. Uh, there were uh, four animal tests done very quickly. It's uh, pretty amazing uh, that this can be set up through the medical school. And this, I think, gave us a real heads up uh, and a leg up with the um, uh, FDA when we applied for FDA regulation. Um, next slide. So the Bakken, Bakken Medical Devices Center got turned into a um, manufacturing facility. So here's Steve taking over the art kid room, his office, and maybe he's still there, I'm not sure. Um, and the innovation fellow side, we, we were collecting um, uh, components uh, uh, from 15 or, or so different vendors. Next slide. Um, so here we are. Um, we were able to, uh, again, thanks to being told, our, we got 70 volunteers. These are former interns at the Bakken Center um, that volunteered and came in, got permission to come in. They were uh, certainly uh, phased uh, social distance apart. Um, it smelled like a machine shop for about a week later. Next day, slide please. Um, so here's March 24th. Um, totally incredible. Um, these are our working units. Uh, so we built 25 units uh, starting on the 16th to the 24th. Truly amazing um, how this worked. Next slide, please. So here we are, um, social distancing, but uh, on the left, you'll see, and the right, uh, we have members from Boston Scientific, from TechCom, uh, from United Health Group. And uh, this was a, a meeting where we showed a working prototype. Again, a very few days afterwards, talked and discussed the units. And at that point in time, it was uh, decided, Boston Scientific and United Healthcare decided to team up. Team up. Next slide, please. Um, Aaron Tucker is one of the PhD students. Uh, the other PhD students here, four of them, plus uh, uh, NUMD, who is one of our innovation fellows. Uh, incredible team. Uh, they were all, um, it would be unusual for PhD students to be able to pull these things off, but this is what the device center is about. We actually had 650 people and uh, companies uh, volunteer to help us. It's an incredible show of uh, passion and compassion for what the needs are. So these would include companies like Turo, Tenant, General Mills, Toyota, et cetera. Um, and uh, they still are waiting in line and, and wanting to help us. Next slide. So Aaron was really the, the uh, project manager on this. Um, you can see on the right-hand side version. So we, we're already at version 3.2, which is the one that we turned over to Boston Scientific 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, so on the left-hand side is a, a nearly finalized Boston Scientific unit. So um, the, the picture I showed you where we were all uh, there on, on that Saturday, Boston Scientific started. Their day one was March 28th, uh, which was about 12 days after we started. We were also working with uh, Perio, which is a North Dakota company. And they're also building 300 units uh, for the governor and for the state of, of North Dakota. Next slide, please. Um, so we, um, on, on the left hand, right hand side, you see NU with uh, the uh, prototype for the ECMO unit. We, we actually have five or six other projects still going on it at MDC. Um, we um, had a file uh, release on, on May 11th um, for worldwide uh, free option to make uh, units. Uh, there are already 25 people without even advertising. There are 25 people, including I think eight or nine countries that have contacted us. Um, uh, Boston is uh, delivering, they already have almost a thousand made and they'll have the 3000 by uh, early June and uh, to be delivered to United Healthcare. Now Boston's teaming up with um, Medtronic. So these, this is a unusual as well. There's so many uh, new and unusual things that happen here with people stepping up um, and they, they work with us of course in Hogan levels. Um, the emergency use authorization was 30 days. We were the first um, ventilator of, of our type to get approved by the um, um, uh, by, by the FDA. And the FDA official said, the genius of this device is its simplicity. So um, very quick introduction, please go to uh, next slide. Um, go to our website. Uh, here's, here's our um, version four model, which is ready to go into injection molding if the demand goes above uh, 3000 units. And the website has lots of, of other things. This was a truly, truly amazing activity. Uh, when the challenges come up, then you know people dig down deep, I think. And um, uh, it doesn't matter if it's 24 seven or not. Um, you know, we, we, we wanna help solve healthcare problems. And uh, given the tremendous um, basis that the university has um, provided for the medical devices center and facility, uh, we were ready and we were ready to work with TechCom and also uh, medical school to make this happen. So thank you for the opportunity to chat with you about this. It's, it's uh, a real privilege. Thanks, Art. You make us proud. Uh, next up, um, as Minnesota's Life Science Industry Association, the Medical Alley Association promotes and connects us all. Frank Jaskolke, VP of Intelligence at Medical Alley, will now be sharing how they support innovation in Minnesota. Thanks for joining us, Frank. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, it's it's fun following art and hearing the story of the co-venter because there really is no other place on earth where something like that could happen, where leaders from Boston Scientific, Medtronic, United Health Group, and the university could come together so quickly, develop a life-saving, life-sustaining product, bring it through the FDA, get it to manufacturing, get it out to distribution in a month. And that, that right there is what makes this community Medical Alley and makes it the global epicenter of health innovation and care. As Mary said, my name is Frank Chiskalki and I'm with the Medical Alley Association and I'm honored to be here with you today for this very special edition of Walleye Tank. As we all know, the COVID-19 crisis has disrupted every facet of our lives. But what I feel great about is that so many of you have responded with compassion, a helping hand and innovation. The difference in this crisis is all of you and the work that you're doing to bring solutions. Uh, Medical Alley is very proud to support this event and to support the startup community. 
more than 50% of our members in digital health devices and drugs are startup companies. And we work every day with them to help them connect to resources, to investors, to talent, to suppliers, to partners, to information they need to advance their life-saving and life-sustaining product. Our policy agenda works to promote innovation in this community by supporting things like the Angel Investor Tax Credit or supporting the establishment of Launch Minnesota, one of our great partner organizations, as well as to make sure that we have a strong research enterprise creating new knowledge and creating new technology like that at the University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic. In the last five years, more than $3 billion has been raised by startup companies in this community to advance health innovation. And researchers like those at the University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic have brought in billions of more dollars for critical research to solve medicine's hardest problems. If you're working on a startup or if you have a growing company or you're part of one of the global giants in Medical Alley and you need help, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or to anyone else at the Medical Alley Association. We will do everything in our power to help you find that right connection, the piece of information, the resource that you need so that your work can be more productive and you can bring more life-saving and life-sustaining products to market. I'm honored to work with you every day and thank you so much for spending your Friday afternoon with us. Back to you, Mary. Thanks, Frank. Uh, now a few fish housekeeping rules. Um, uh, first, each presenter will have four minutes to tell their story. If a story gets a little bit too long, we'll mute their microphones just so that we keep the day on track. So sit back and relax in, in the comfort of your home and enjoy some great stories. Um, each storyteller uh, will be talking about the problem that they're solving with their solution, how they're solving it, how their team is the right team to solve it and what they need or an ask. You'll find their contact information on the last slide or in the description of the YouTube live stream and they need your help. First up, uh, the first section is actually about diagnosing the viruses and understanding spread. And the first uh, presenter is Dr. Daryl Gull. He will be, um, uh, or excuse me, Daryl is no stranger to the walleye tank and will be telling us today about the cutting edge ways his team of scientists are tracking epidemics across Minnesota, including the SARS COVID-2 pandemic we're experiencing today. Uh, reminder to fever inspect that you're up after Dr. Gold. Take it away, Daryl. Thank you, Mary. Um, so as Mary said, I'm, I'm Daryl Gold and I lead the University of Minnesota Genomics Center's Innovation Lab. And I'm going to tell you about our MIN SOS initiative today. Uh, so this is not uh, the first time I've been to Walleye Tank. I was actually part of the team that won the inaugural Walleye Tank pitch competition back in 2016. I actually have our Walleye trophy here. <laughs> Normally hangs proudly in our lab. Um, and it was a really great event. That was a real springboard for our company. And I'm hoping that today's event is gonna really accelerate the work of all the great innovators um, that are working the battle of COVID-19 in our state. Um, so as I'm sure you're all aware, there's an epidemic that's spreading throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, and this raises questions about which strains are circulating and how quickly they might be changing or evolving. Um, where the outbreaks that are spreading across the state uh, are, are being seeded from and whether different strains uh, are, are more transmissible or more destructive. And genomics tools, DNA sequencing tools, give us a way to address these questions. So this epidemic I'm talking about is, of course, the spread of zebra mussels, which have been infesting the lakes and rivers of Minnesota in recent years. And we've been, a, I've been part of the team at the University of Minnesota that's been applying DNA sequencing tools um, to, to look at how muscles are spreading from lake to lake and to try to identify weaknesses to try to try to, try to stop them. And really identical methods are being used right now to track the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the, the virus that causes COVID-19 globally. This is basically a multi-generational family tree that shows uh, all the different viral strains that have been sequenced around the world. The red dots here are actually viral strains that are circulating here in Minnesota. And these sequences come from the Minnesota Department of Health, who's been at the forefront of, of doing this viral surveillance and sequencing. They're actually the first public health lab to, to sequence the coronavirus in the country. 
And so we've been partnering with researchers at the Minnesota Department of Health um, and also researchers and clinicians at the Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota uh, to launch this MinSOS initiative for, for Minnesota surveillance of SARS-CoV-2. And our, our goal is to try to sequence a large number of coronavirus genomes across the state in the coming months in order to provide surveillance into, into the spread of the virus in the state. And we're, we're also um, part of a con consortium uh, led by the CDC that, that's um, doing this sequencing and viral tracking. So why are we the right people to do this? Well, the, the Genomics Innovation Lab, um, our, our, our mandate is to develop scalable and accurate genomics technologies. We've been applying these not only to zebra mussels, but also developing methods to study the microbiome, the, the community's microorganisms that live in your gut and on your body. And this is technology that was spun out into CoreBiome, the, the startup that we pitched at the first wall, I think. Um, we've also been applying these tools to study, to, together with researchers at the University of Minnesota, to study infectious diseases like HIV and tuberculosis and others. And so any good pitch should have a hockey stick. Um, this is our hockey stick. Uh, so because of this deep expertise in genomics um, and, and molecular biology, our team was part of the team that, that um, spun up COVID-19 diagnostic testing here at the University of Minnesota. And this was together with uh, clinicians at, at the Molecular Diagnostics Lab and at Fairview. And as you can see, we've been really ramping up testing and, and, and in, in order to meet Governor Walz's moonshot goal of being able to test 10,000 patients a day here in Minnesota. And as we've been doing this testing, we've also been beginning to sequence uh, some of these strains in order to look at the, look at the actual uh, genome of the virus. And just earlier this week, we published a method that dramatically reduces the cost of sequencing the coronavirus genome. Um, we, th this is actually very similar to methods that we've used to study the microbiome in the past that we've applied to hundreds of thousands of samples over the past several years. So we know that we can scale this up to really large scale. And what we're asking for you for today is for you to support our MinSOS effort. Um, you can sponsor the sequencing of a coronavirus genome for just $40 at, at this link here. And I'd also like to um, make an appeal to any philanthropists or, or potential corporate sponsors to consider supporting our research mission at the UMGC's Innovation Lab, where we're working to solve problems ranging from uh, COVID-19 to the spread of zebra mussels across the state. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. That was amazing. Uh, next, we'll turn to Fever Inspect, presented by Dr. Beal, who is looking to turn up the temperature on remote fever detection devices. Their specialized products provide highly accurate measurements, and I expect that we'll be seeing them in operation everywhere soon. Reminder to Flow Field Imaging Laboratory that you're up next. Take it away, Dr. Beal. Thank you, Mary. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Bell with Thermal DX presenting Fever Inspect, a tool to keep us safe as we return to work. How do I? Oh, there we are. Okay, so the problem as we return to work is that there's a risk of a second peak of COVID 19. Fast identification is essential to prevent shutdown of critical industries, but frequent deep nasal swab testing is expensive and impractical. And unfortunately, we've now seen what can happen with the pork plants that have been shutting down across the country and many other. Uh, plants. And ultimately, safety and morale are, are compromised without screening. So what is thermography? It uses thermal imaging to view body heat. And if it's done right, it can give an accurate core body temperature. This is a non-contact high volume screening method. It's widely used across Asia in previous and current outbreaks to accurately identify fever, feverish individuals. However, it's mainly used by technicians for electrical inspections. Part of, that's part of the reason why there's very little innovation from thermal imaging incumbents. They're essentially using the same method from 2003, invented by a Minnesotan as it happens. Uh, workplace screening has specific challenges that can't be addressed with repurposing outdated technologies like others are doing. We offer a new way that works. The fever inspect advantage is that our system is easy, accurate, and cost-effective. There's no technician needed. It's fully automatic. It's a simple setup anyone could do. It's got the best accuracy and usability for the application. Furthermore, we've taken the lead on EEOC and ADA guidelines and HIPAA regulations, which haven't even been an afterthought for the other systems. And there are serious issues there. The EEOC in particular has issued guidance 
a month and two weeks ago that this is still considered generally a medical procedure and you have to be cautious with who sees the data. Now, what is our team advantage? We are domain experts in thermal system design. We got a front row seat on two very high volume thermography, thermal imaging system design applications. And we learned a lot about the industry and that was years ago. And we've learned a lot since. As a result of all of our expertise, we've been able to find multiple patents for fever inspect in areas that other companies haven't even thought of. We have a unique combination of hardware, computer vision, AI, and human physiologic monitoring. Two people on our team have run medical studies. Ultimately, building from the ground up for this application is what gives Fever Inspect the advantage. Now, we, we've got a white paper describing how to assess a fever screening system, and it'll be available on our website soon. However, I wanna show a few examples of what's wrong with current systems because there isn't a lot of time here, and I want people to know what can go wrong. This is a mostly good example, but the forehead can be low by as much as one degree Celsius, missing many fevers needlessly. You must be able to see the inner eye region if you want accuracy. This is clearly showing in many product literature. The uh, FDA put out guidance two weeks ago that reiterated the eye region and the ISO standards. That's not the worst though. There are some that don't even use a temperature reference and without it, you can't get better than two degrees Celsius, which is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. You're just flipping a coin at that point. I can't believe people are selling these, but they are. Uh, also, there are ones with impossibly low resolution, and it's not magic. It's averaging different pixels together, and these are off by as much as 10 degrees. And if you look there, it says 37.5 degrees Celsius, which is impossible. There's some trickery going on here. Uh, finally, if you use a manual screener, it's essentially like having a TSA process implemented in your, in your facility, and that is very difficult to keep going, and it takes a lot of time to run. Um, here's a product from one of the thermal camera manufacturers. You can time how long it takes this guy to screen and so on, and it's, it's not pretty. It's very difficult to scale that up. The market potential right now is very high. It's practically unlimited. It's limited only by the supply. And we value priced it at $5,000 per unit, which is half to a third the cost of what's being offered now. As the US reopens, more and more places will screen, and we think federal screening policies are, are coming. Our current status is that we have a large local food processor purchasing over 100 units. Uh, we're just a few weeks out from our first manufacturing run. Ultimately, we are looking for connections to potential customers and distributors. We're also looking for connections to hospital systems. Our goal is to make this the first medical grade fever scanner. And you'll see medical grade this, that, but we mean actual medical grade, where it really is accurate and vetted by the FDA and independent testing labs. Thank you, and please visit our site at www.feverinspect.com. Thank you, Dr. Bell. I'm sure temperature checking will be part of our new normal very, very soon. Next, Dr. Hong and his team from the University of Minnesota's Flow Field Imaging Laboratory are experts in the modeling and simulation of dynamic fluids and are applying these techniques to better understand the transmission of COVID-19. This is a reminder to Checkable Medical and Patty that you're up next. Uh, Dr. Hong, you're up. All right, thank you, Mary. Um, I'm here today to share with you uh, three, uh, some of the ongoing research supported by our uh, OVPR of University of Minnesota Rapid Response Grant. So here we are two mechanical engineers, myself and Dr. Shou Yang. We are from the field of fluid mechanics and we use our diagnostic and simulation tool to try to understand how the fluid flow transport the virus disease. There are a lot of students are voluntarily involved in this research. So the main focus of research is to understand air, airborne transmission of the disease. And this is really our highly debated uh, topic right now, but it comes there are more and more evidence kind of showing uh, airborne transmission for COVID-19 is uh, really there. And so that uh, the lack of understanding of how the virus has been transmitted through the air, it really results in a large inconsistency of different uh, prevention measures and how effective and uh, appropriate those measures are. So our research is trying to focus on uh, this uh, um, air transmission caused by this asymptomatic individuals. So that means uh, the person doesn't exhibit any uh, obvious disease, uh, the symptoms such as coughing and sneezing. They could transmit the disease by generating aerosols through the speaking and breathing, these normal respiratory motions. So 
our goal is to combine in the simulation and uh, our experimental tool to develop, eventually develop a systematic framework and to provide estimate of the transmissions. So first we uh, conduct uh, experiments and higher diagnostic of aerosol generations that includes airflows, concentration, or size distribution of aerosols, including the chemical contents indicated by the optical properties of aerosols to evaluate uh, how the aerosol generation changes uh, according to different uh, respiratory motions, such as uh, breathing and speaking and singing and even playing music instruments and how these motions are being, uh, uh, being controlled by wearing masks and no masks. We're gonna look at the population with different age and gender. So this information will serve as input to the numerical simulations and where the dot that the so Young's group will be in charge and they will come, you'll use this uh, input to simulate uh, information to simulate uh, aerosol residence time and how long the aerosol stay in the air and then what is spatial and temporal variation of aerosols in different uh, practical settings that includes classroom, restaurant, supermarket, and public trails and other you know, settings that is tuned for specific industry and uh, public applications. So we're gonna look at how these different prevention measures and to affect this uh, transport and uh, infectiousness of this uh, different uh, um, airborne transmitted uh, pathways. And eventually our goal is to develop our actionable science-driven policy that provides uh, directly probability of different risks under different practical settings. And we, based on these uh, simulations, we wanna be able to design the prevention measures tuned for different practical settings. For example, in offices versus uh, public uh, you know, parks, uh, the hospitals versus you know, the restaurants, they may have different, uh, you know, uh, policies and tune for the specific settings. So here's a, just uh, showing you the, uh, the diagnostic capabilities we have. We involved, we using heavily the non-invasive imaging diagnostics where we can quantify the breathing flow directly from the people and measuring instantaneous brain rate, breathing rate. We also have this digital in non-holographic imaging that allow us to directly detect the microscopic aerosols produced by different respiratory motions ranging from 0.5 micron to 100 micron, just through the imaging. Here's a 3D reconstruction of this aerosol produced by the normal breathing, which is a, a very difficult to be, to be detected with other additional uh, other measurement techniques. So using this technique, uh, we're gonna uh, use this as uh, input for our simulations. And so, uh, my colleague, Dr. Soyan, is an expert of simulating spray generation in the engines. So now he's using his expertise trying to simulate how this aerosol is produced by the humans and being propagated in different uh, practical settings. You can think about a classroom, a person standing and giving a lectures and it's producing the aerosols and there's different students sitting uh, different spacings and when the classroom seconds last... left, Dr. Hong. Okay, so let me go to the last slide. And so the mainly the uh, goal of this is to combine this uh, uh, diagnostic and simulation to provide the scientific driven prevention policies. And so what do we need right now? We need a collaboration of people from the field of virology and policies related to the virus transmissions. We'd like to have some funding support to continue our research and expand this to a larger scales. We would like to have a computational resources allow us to simulate under different scenarios. And if you're interested, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. Here's my email. Thank you. Thank you, Zhuang. I enjoy working with you. Uh, next up, we're pleased to see Checkable Medical join us again at the Wally Tank. Patty Post and her team won the mid-level reelers division of the Wally Tank pitch competition this past December. And she's here to tell us about their product line extension they've, that she's taken in response to COVID-19. Reminder to lead from Minnesota that you're up next. Take it away, Patty. Thank you, Mary. Hello, everyone. My name is Patty Post, and I'm founder and CEO of Checkable Medical. Over the past 16 years, next slide, please. Over the past 16 years, I've spent dozens of hours in urgent cares with the three of my kids with the sore throat symptoms, only to get negative tests back. It was a waste of time and money, but I'm not alone here. Every year, over 50 million people visit a healthcare provider for the symptoms of a sore throat, when 75% of the time, those visits are negative. 
So I created Checkable Medical to develop an at-home rapid strep platform that seamlessly teaches consumers on how to take a throat sample, check the results, and get treated from the comfort of their home. When we spoke back in December, at-home diagnostics were seen as a nice to have that would require massive consumer behavior change. Five months later, it's become a necessity consumers are begging for. Our team is rapidly growing to offer the same at-home diagnostic capabilities for COVID-19 that we were developing for strep, anchored by our mission, empowering consumers to make evidence-based clinical decisions from the comfort of their home. Checkable Medical is the ex exclusive at-home distributor of a COVID-19 antibody test from Clarity Diagnostic. These are rapid finger prick tests that determine if patients have the antibodies left over from fighting COVID-19 with 96% accuracy, a vital tool in reopening our economy. Our proprietary digital platform instructs users on how to take the test, read the results, and make informed decisions about their healthcare. We identified synergies from our work with STREP and seamlessly transitioned those solutions to address this new pandemic and are already in the midst of clinical trials. We are focused on three customers, consumers, employer groups, retail clinics. While all unique, these three customer segments have one common objective, enable accurate, convenient, and reliable testing. Next slide, please, thank you. So here's why Checkable's rapid finger prick test is best in market at meeting our consumer's objectives. First, testing quality. Checkable is the premier solution in development with 96% accuracy, currently validating with two clinical trials. The tests are produced in Europe, mitigating supply chain risk. Convenient point of care. Our rapid test delivers results in 10 minutes and can be done on site at the place of employment or at a local retail clinic. We're also executing a trial for EUA clearance for direct to consumer use. Three, ease of use. Our digital platform takes users through the simple process of taking a finger prick sample, collecting and confirming results with a medical provider, all done on our custom checkable medical platform. Next slide, please. As founder and CEO, I've spent my career as a medical device executive and have built a passionate, diverse and best in class team. We have an ideal blend of scientists, regulators, clinical and technical experts, physicians, marketers, and business leaders. Next slide, please. Today, we're asking for your support to follow our company on all things social. You can find us using the handle at Checkable Medical. As our business continues to expand, we hope that you stay up to date as our, as our approvals come through. We also have 2 million rapid COVID antibody tests ready to distribute to CLIA certified labs. These tests are made in America and point of care tests. COVID-19 is scary. It's confusing and it's not going away. Next slide, please. We're creating a solution that saves time, saves money, and empowers patients and employer groups to make evidence-based medical decisions with accuracy and convenience. Checkable medical, because healthcare begins at home. Thank you, Mary. Awesome, Patty. <laughs> Thank you. Um, diagnostic capabilities will absolutely be necessary to ensure we all get back to work as soon as possible. Can't wait. Last up in this session, we have Benya Kraus, co-founder of Lead for America and executive director of Lead for Minnesota. Their mission is to develop leaders in local communities and they're working to train the next generation of contact tracers, individuals who are instrumental in tackling this pandemic. Take it away, Benya. Awesome, thanks so much, Mary. And great to join you all from our hometown headquarters of Waseca, Minnesota. Um, Lead for Minnesota works to ensure that our nation's most dynamic young leaders are working on their community's toughest challenges. And what tougher challenge around workforce than our contact tracing workforce? Uh, national estimates say that we are in need of a contact tracing workforce of 300,000 people over the next 12 to 18 months 
the number here in Minnesota is up to 4,000. National leaders are calling for uh, the next round of federal stimulus package to include an increase in the number of positions related to national service. This is especially pertinent during a time in which we have a new generation that is unemployed, crippled with student loan debt, but so eager to serve. Over the past two and a half years, our national organization, Lead for America, has supported 54 fellows across 21 different states to work in their hometown local governments in two-year paid fellowships. A story of this is Sean Dean, our fellow in Monument Valley, Utah, who has raised over $2 million at this point in food distribution efforts across the entire Navajo Nation. Her story illustrates our capacity to recruit, train, and place young, dynamic, and locally rooted leaders in their hometown communities to face their toughest needs. Our national CEO and found, uh, and our national uh, board chair is CEO and founder of Baltimore Core, Fagan Harris. And Baltimore Core is arguably one of the nation's best models of service being able to transform a city. They've recently launched a citywide contact tracing core, and we are working with Baltimore Core to bring their uh, recruitment, application processing at high volumes, and uh, talent matching services and infrastructure to the Minnesota context. Lastly, we as a Lead for Minnesota organization, as of this Monday, will be an official AmeriCorps program. That means that our fellows will not need to pay their federal student loans while they serve, and they'll also be eligible to a federal education award at the end of each year of their service. Our current program positions us to have 20 fellows serving across the state in rural local governments by this fall. They are working on direct COVID related relief efforts and will be in their communities for the long term engaged in thinking of, hey, where are we gonna go post COVID-19 and how are we going to rebuild our communities? We are excited to pitch today to say that we would love to expand our existing recruitment infrastructure, as well as our high volume application processing and talent matching infrastructure to be deployed towards the state's contact tracing workforce efforts. In line with our mission and our values, we look to recruit people who are unemployed and furloughed Minnesota workers, indigenous communities, people of color and young people to, to be at the forefronts of serving their own local neighborhoods. Our team is Minnesota based, but we leverage our national staff as well as the staff at Baltimore Corps to be able to repurpose this recruitment infrastructure to the Minnesota context. We are currently developing a partnership, uh, uh, exploring a partnership with Serve Minnesota, our state's AmeriCorps commission to leverage their national service infrastructure and combine it with our recruitment and application processing systems. We are actively seeking a partnership with DEED, the Department of Health, the governor's office to have them choose national service to be a core part of the state's contact tracing efforts. And if you are a local government wanting to add capacity to your community around public health and contact tracing efforts, please also do reach out as we'd love to explore what hosting a fellow in your community might look like. So please, for everyone watching, join us if you believe national service is the key to addressing historic unemployment and urgent demand for a COVID response workforce. You can donate or visit us online. And lastly, to end uh, with a quote from David Brooks from his recent New York Times article, we as a country need a COVID response that fits the kind of people we are. And as Minnesotans, national service is truly an essential piece of that response. Thanks so much and would love a conversation to talk further. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, that's inspiring. <laughs> I want to tell my daughter to sign up. <laughs> Please do. We're recruiting. <laughs> Applications open. <laughs> Great. With that, I'll close the first session and pass the microphone to my friend, Dr. Stephen Ecker, who will lead us through the second session of today's presentations. They're all yours, Steve. Thank you, Mary. Uh, it's my pleasure to kick off the second session for today's presentations. That first session was really awesome. Now the next five teams have created new and ingenious uh, protective equipment or PPE, an acronym we all now uh, know and are familiar with, but it's for our healthcare workers as well as for the rest of us to keep us safe and as we venture back into the work workforce uh, and our communities begin to reopen. This is, these, these projects are extremely topical. First off, we'll hear from Respirvent, a team we're especially excited about because not only have they devised some impressive technology to keep people safe, they have also the first team of walleye tank history to have a live WeFunder 
Uh, this is this equity crowdfunding partnership campaign running while they're presenting. If you like what they have to offer, you can actually invest in their company today. Before they present, I want to remind Breathe99 that they're up after. The stage is yours, Michael. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, my name is Michael Doyle, founder of Respirant, along with co-founder Peter Flaherty. Respirant is seeking at least $100,000 on WeFunder. A SAFE stands for Simple Agreement for Equity. Think of it like a certificate that says how much money you've invested. During the next priced round, the SAFE will convert into shares. We have patent pending claims. Therefore, this diagram may not reflect all of our claims, let alone the potential of this device. The next slide is meant to briefly touch on how Respirvent came about, as well as the stages of our technology before, during, and after the pre-seed round. Where did Respirvent come from? In response to this pandemic, my business partner and I halted the operations of our other company, R&D Labs. Instead, we decided to identify the challenges with COVID-19 and see what we could come up with. The aim was to design a mechanical solution that could make a positive impact on this pandemic under the FDA's emergency use authorizations. Once we realized um, that we were onto something potentially useful, we decided to create a new entity, Respirvent, to own it and take it to the next level. Now we're ready for experts to evaluate our latest prototype. With our pre-seed investment, we could reach a readiness level of nine and start a seed round of fundraising to scale up. The next slide is meant to communicate the mission and purpose of Respirvent. Where did Respirvent come from? In response to this pandemic, my business partner and I halted. Well, uh, we created Respirvent SBC, not just in response to COVID-19, but to all the challenges involved with respiratory infection. The purpose of incorporating as a specific benefit corporation is to maximize not only shareholder value, but the value of all stakeholders within the context of our mission. The next slide will focus more on the value proposition of our initial product offering. One of the problems we identified with current treatment of COVID-19 is that there were very few treatment options available before the use of a ventilator becomes necessary. We came up with a mask that can reduce pathogenic replication rates by only allowing airflow in one direction through your mouth and out your nose. It is also intended to flush out nasal excretions to mitigate replication in other microbiomes of the body. Initially, we will try to only use commercially off the shelf components so that we can make a positive impact as soon as practical. It's also compatible with positive pressure devices like CPAP, BiPAP, and other oxygen devices. The purpose of the next three slides is to show the different stages of infection, disease, and recovery, and where our device fits. The rise in this graph rep represents the increasing severity of the infection as well as the viral load or concentration of the virus. This mask may also be used to protect yourself, especially if you're aware that you have a pre-existing condition. Otherwise, it would be used for people who tested positive or for those who are symptomatic. The next slide covers the disease stage. We think our device could be used in all these stages of the disease until mechanical ventilation is required. Our product may reduce the need for ventilators and decrease the patient's time to recover. This would increase the availability of beds and hopefully reduce the impact of this pandemic. Once you peak at any period of these stages, then the next slide describes the period of decline of the disease. This device could prevent reoccurrence of the disease until your immune system can manage on its own as well as avoid other infections. The next slide is about our team of co-founders. By education, I'm a nanoscience technologist and manufacturing engineer with five years of experience. I've earned several national and state awards. Pete is an inventor, designer, and fabricator by trade and education with over 25 years of business experience. Check out our LinkedIn profiles from our WeFunder page for more information. The next slide is meant to share what we need to make an impact on this pandemic as soon as possible. We need medical doctors, among other professionals, to evaluate our prototype. 
Between the pre-seed and seed stages of fundraising, we need to validate the product market fit, configure a minimum viable product, improve our intellectual property, recruit a lead investor, among other roles in our team, launch a pre-order website and more. The emergency use authorization will allow us to sell this device during this pandemic, but we also need to prepare for the FDA's breakthrough medical device program with small business innovation research funding. The next slide is meant to share the various ways of following up with us. So if you have any questions, interests, or would like to help in any way, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're in our lab weekdays from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m., as well as weekend afternoons. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Stay well. Great work, Resprevent. For everybody, please be sure to check out their WeFunder page in the description of the video. Next up, we'll hear from Breathe99's Max, uh, sorry, Max, uh, Bak uh, I'm messing up the name, Max uh, <laughs> Ronson, who, believe it or not, have been making high performance masks for health and wellness long before most of us ever heard of a coronavirus. Team <laughs> Scum, take note that you're up next. Max, tell us all about Breathe99. Great, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Max Bach Aronson and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Breathe99. And we're a Minneapolis-based public benefit corporation that was uh, founded in 2018. And uh, I, this is something that I've been working on for several years and was I developed my passion surrounding this topic after a study abroad experience that I had in Singapore. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, obviously COVID, uh, the pandemic has had really sort of far reaching effects throughout our society, but our team is most interested in, in this idea that every person deserves access to high quality public health goods. And we believe that by having wider access to these types of uh, resources and tools that we would be able to slow the spread of the pandemic and then also advance other public health objectives as they pertain to air pollution. Um, we've been working on this for several years and our specific focus is addressing the supply chain issues that impede broad access to PPE. Uh, we've, had, we've experienced some good early success both on crowdfunding and with raising money through the philanthropic communities and specifically Venn Foundation. We're also very uh, fortunate and honored to have been the recipients of the Proto Labs Cool Idea Award. So very excited about that partnership. Uh, so what we're working on right now is B2 Mask. It's a comfortable, reusable piece of face wear that offers excellent protection and it helps reduce filter waste and cost by up to half. Uh, there's three sort of uh, distinct parts of the mask. There's a flexible face piece that provides both a comfortable and a protective seal on a user's face. Uh, that face piece is then loaded with high efficiency electrostatically charged disposable filters that help remo remove harmful contaminants from the air you breathe. And then all of that is uh, wrapped in a breathable fabric overlay, which provides users with a range of customization options and also is what harnesses the face piece to a user's face and, and creates that protective seal. We're already in production actually, and uh, we'll be shipping this summer. And we're really excited as part of our public benefit mission to be donating uh, many masks in our first production run around 25%. So that's very exciting for us. Uh, there are several aspects of the mask that we feel uh, provide ben clear benefits to to users over competitive options. And, and these benefits were, were uh, we arrived at these after several years of a human-centered design process that's built upon feedback that we gained in China, in Korea, and then also here in the US in, in trying, in providing prototypes to people and getting their feedback. So again, there, it provides a comfortable airtight seal, which is something that we've all heard a lot about uh, as it pertains to cloth masks and even surgical masks as well. Um, and then really the big thing in the context of the, the pandemic is that the whole system is built upon an affordable and scalable filter model 
that provides prote- the high level of protection that people need, but uh, it is not cost prohibitive. And so that's one of the big advantages as we think about how this technology can, can affect all types of people, uh, both in healthcare settings and in the general public as well. I'm very honored to uh, be speaking on behalf of a really talented and passionate team. Uh, we have you know, over a decade of experience bringing medical, uh, doing medical device development and sales. And uh, we, we just, we're coming together again on this mission of making high quality public health products more widely available. So we're, we're all really excited to be working together on this. Uh, and it, like I said, um, we believe that together we'll be able to have a lasting impact on public health objectives. Um, in terms of what we're looking for, and we are hoping to build relationships with pilot partners who want to receive B2 mask and, and will sort of feed this uh, really important feedback loop about usability and how, the, how a reusable mask can fit into existing workflows. We're hoping to connect with impact investors who are interested in propelling scalable benef- uh, public benefit corporations, and then also mentors who, are, who have deep experience in healthcare supply chains, and also as recently identified uh, people who have experience in impact reporting and also nonprofit uh, management as well. 10 seconds left, Matt. Great. Uh, and so thank, thank you everybody for your time. We really appreciate it and we hope to hear from you. Thank you, Max. We'll need some of those uh, nice masks for our lab, I'm sure. Uh, Dr. Michael Wallace is a gastroenterologist at Mayo Clinic Florida who, along with his team, have innovated in the clinic out of necessity to protect his clinical colleagues during procedures and put them at an increased risk of exposure. Team Scone have developed an easy to use technology to reduce COVID-19 exposure risk for clinicians performing life-saving procedures such as innovations. Reminder uh, to in control technologies that they're up next. Go ahead, Dr. Wallace. Good, thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to present uh, at this symposium. Uh, Please advance to the next slide, please. As you all are well aware, the problem of controlling COVID-19 transmission to healthcare workers centers around the control of aerosolized droplets of live particles. When patients sneeze or cough or even breathe, a large cloud of active viral particles is transmitted through the air in small droplets. These can extend up to three to six feet uh, and possibly even further onto uh, services. Next slide, please. The current methods for controlling the aerosol uh, transmission are either to wrap the healthcare worker in personal protective equipment. You've all seen these images of emergency department physicians, nurses, and technologists wrapped in single-use disposable paper supplies. Each of these is typically thrown away after one exposure. There's, these are wasteful and unlimited supply, as we're all well aware. The second, much more expensive option is to put the patient in a negative pressure room. The air is suctioned out and sent through HEPA Uh, filtration to remove the virus particles. These are uh, very rarely available, typically only one or two in large hospitals, and many hospitals do not have uh, any of these. Our mission is to develop a low-cost system to contain aerosolized infectious droplets around the infected patients while minimizing the waste of personal protective equipment. Our uh, team developed the so-called self-contained negative environment pressure box or scone box. It was built on a simple barrier concept that has previously been developed called the intubation box. This provides a physical barrier uh, while in use during the most high risk procedures, intubation of the patient or performing surgery or upper endoscopy. We've modified this box using low cost design systems and added negative pressure uh, systems and HEPA filtration that mimic the negative pressure room at a fraction of the cost. The device is mobile, reusable and cleanable. We've tested the device. We know that it works well using a simulated cough. We can generate using a a standardized puffer system to generate up to 30 to 35,000 virus size particles at 0.3 microns. This is the same size as the coronavirus particles. These particles are rapidly cleared within three to four minutes from the box down to ambient levels. 
We also know in preliminary testing that it's safe. This is a patient inside the box monitoring oxygen saturation and carbon dioxide retention, both of which show normal levels of oxygen and normal levels of carbon dioxide retention. The next steps, excuse me, our team involves physicians, uh, healthcare, uh, environmental engineers, simulation experts, and business development expertise. Our major next steps are manufacturing and upscaling of the box. Uh, Mayo Clinic Department of Engineering has already begun investing funds in research and development for device uh, optimization and testing. And clearly there is a need for uh, low cost 3D printable systems, which is already underway. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention uh, and your interest in our device, the SCONE. Thank you, Mike. Very impressive work. Can't wait to see more. Um, okay, up next, In Control Technologies has one of the most unique innovations that we will see today, but their elegant solution is one for a very easy to understand problem. Masks are inconvenient, and as workplaces and communities reopen, dealing with that problem is a great opportunity for innovation. Wait till you see what Michael uh, Zumbrunnen has in mind. Quick reminder for a respirator safety hood team that you'll be up next. Take it away, Michael. Thank you. And thanks to all the organizers for being so helpful to us. Takeout is good, but it's not the same as going out to eat or drink. I want to share with you a new face mask that helps bars and restaurants, and we'll be asking for your feedback in a bit, so thanks to all you listeners, too. Bars and restaurants are a vibrant and missed part of our culture. Reduced occupancy does not seem like a sustainable solution for this industry, and current face masks are not practical when you're eating or drinking. The Recover face mask helps bring us back together at bars and restaurants in a safer and practical way. On the left, you see Recover in the closed position. The middle picture shows it transitioning to the open position, which is shown on the right. After taking a bite or a sip, the process is reversed. You can see that Recover is worn like a regular mask. One difference, though, is its straps are attached to a chin piece instead of the mask. Now the mask is free to transition between uncovering and recovering the mouth. The transition can be done manually with one finger or automatically with a small motor and proximity sensor. For quick availability, the manual version would be first and the automated would follow. For easy compatibility, we designed Recover to work with homemade and commercially available masks. For consumers really, no mask is preferred. But if masks are recommended, then Recover is more, re more comfortable than taking off and on today's face mask while eating and drinking. Secondly, Recover mask is meant to help consumers feel more confident returning to bars and restaurants. And it's cheap and easy to use. On the chart's right side for bars and restaurants, Recover is a year-round weather-independent option. It could be used in combination with other ways to combat COVID-19 like social distancing and potentially could lead to higher occupancy allowances. Here is a high level rollout for Recover. All of these tasks showing can be done with Minnesota companies. If you focus on the orange distribution section, our preference is the option to offer Recover direct to bars and restaurants and to do it at cost. We expect 40K is needed to bring the manual version to market and an additional 120K for the automated version. But first, we are asking for your feedback. Please go to at Recover Mask on Twitter and click on the Recover Survey link to go to a three question survey. We're not asking for emails, cell numbers, because it's all anonymous. We would really appreciate your feedback. The team is myself, Laura, and our daughter, Alice, who is a graduate of the Carlson School of Management and a fourth generation U of M grad. We were fortunate to have Alice shelter at home with us for a bit and to have a lab and 3D printers in our home. Recover became our weekend and evening stay at home activity. Laura and I have worked together the past six years developing a self-managed IoT device that saves hair 
for those undergoing chemotherapy and has recently and successfully completed its clinical trials. For bringing it to market, we formed In Control Health. We are very grateful to have received an innovation grant from Launch Minnesota to help us with this effort. This device and recover align with our mission to create simple healthcare solutions, inspire confidence in self-managed devices, and improve the quality of life by building products that are accessible to all. So if you haven't already done so, we'd appreciate your feedback by clicking on the Recover Survey link at Recover Math on Twitter. And if you're interested in investing or have any additional comments, any comments, then please contact me, Mike Z, at incontrol-health-tech.com. Thank you again for hosting and for listening. That's great, Mike. I expect to see these in every restaurant in no time. The last four minute presentation we'll see in this session comes from the University of Minnesota's Respiratory Safety Hood team led by Chris Hogan, who have developed a portable safety hood that can be deployed in a patient's bed to protect healthcare workers from exposure. Tell us more about this project, Chris. Uh, thank you uh, very much everyone for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Chris Hogan, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Minnesota. And I'm representing a rather uh, large team who's been working on um, a way to better protect healthcare workers. Um, so as a couple presentations ago was mentioned, um, uh, the main form of protection for healthcare providers uh, dealing with patients with infectious respiratory diseases is personal protective equipment or PPE. Um, and PPE, um, you need multiple types of it, face shield, mask, gown, gloves, among others. And even still in this case, with more than 10% of the reported infections of COVID-19 being healthcare providers, we know that this isn't fully effective. So the CDC gives us some guidance on what we can do to improve healthcare worker protection. And it isn't all just PPE. If we look above their hierarchy of controls, what we find are engineering controls, isolate people from the hazard. Now, while quite often this can mean negative pressure rooms, we can localize and actually create a more localized negative pressure to work with people. Uh, and that's precisely what we've done. Uh, the respirator hood um, is a, a, a portable device that, that fits over a patient, uh, their upper head, uh, their head and torso fit comfortably uh, within the device. Uh, iris ports provide a form of resistance to flow while at the same time providing multiple providers with, with access. Uh, at the top, what you'll see here is a high efficiency particulate air filter, which is important for several reasons. One, it has a very, very large surface area and this allows us to use very, very strong pumps. Uh, the lifetime of an aerosol generated by the patient inside the respiratory hood is less than seconds. It's cleared almost immediately and we can talk about making it very, very high efficient in this case. Um, we've gone from an initial prototype, uh, you can see with the flow off that you would get smoke penetration through the hood and with flow on, you get very little penetration uh, to the modified form, which is under construction right now, which provides full visibility to multiple healthcare providers and puts the filter off to the, the side in this case. The device works extremely well, to be honest. My laboratory specializes in aerosol science. We have specialized equipment to measure particle concentrations down as small as 10 nanometers and certainly within the size range of viruses or larger. Uh, what I'm plotting here is called the penetration um, of particles. If you see 10 to the minus one, that would mean one out of every 10 particles get through. One out of every 10,000 particles at most penetrates through our device in the virus side. And this is comparing to the side in front of the patient as well as in the rear where, where, the, where the physician would be. Um, the bench tests uh, have been carried out. We've submitted this paper for peer review and we're comfortable saying it is 99.99% efficient in terms of reducing exposure to healthcare providers. And this is even before considering the PPE that they would wear. Our team um, is an interdisciplinary team composed of anesthesiologists, uh, residents in pediatrics, as well as anesthesiology, uh, myself, uh, postdoctoral associates in mechanical engineering, as well as staff scientists with a combined experience of more than 50 years in aerosol science. Uh, what are we looking for uh, to move fo forward? Uh, the device has been tested, mock procedures have been formed, uh, performed with both generation one and generation two. And now we're looking to, the, to tailor these devices for specific procedures. And we would like to get this into the hands of people who want and need to use this device. So if you're a healthcare worker interested in using the device, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we do need continued financial support to make these prototypes in our machine shop in the College of Science and Engineering. 
And then finally, we're looking for experts in the medical device industry interested in bringing this technology to market. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Chris. That sounds like it has the potential to protect many of our healthcare workers. That's really great. Um, finally, um, it's my genuine pleasure to welcome our second keynote speaker today, my friend and colleague, Dr. Mike Joyner. Not only is Dr. Joyner the fourth and last Michael to present in this session, he is also the leader of the Convalescent Plasma Program at the Mayo Clinic, which is showing tremendous success as a potential therapy for COVID-19. Dr. Joyner and his team led a nationwide, lead a nationwide initiative, including over 40 institutions as they document, monitor, and continue to research the effectiveness of this therapy. It is a great opportunity to hear from him today. So thank you for spending your time with us. We can't wait to hear how things are going, uh, Dr. Joyner. Thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, do, can I control these uh, slides or do you control them? You can control, control them if you want. Great. All right, we'll just get started. Uh, do I share my screen or what do I do, you guys? Let's go next slide, please. So what we're trying to do is use convalescent plasma to treat COVID-19. What this means, if you look at the far left on your computer screen, there's a COVID-19 patient. That patient recovers and has antibody-rich plasma. Blood is drawn. The plasma is separated from the red cells. Virus-neutralizing antibodies are in the plasma or serum. And they're used for one of two purposes, for prophylaxis in somebody who's been exposed to COVID-19 or who's at high risk for exposure or to actually treat patients. Next slide. So has this happened or worked before? So here's a use in 1918. This is during the flu pandemic. And you can see here that uh, this individual was febrile, 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 started to get convalescent plasma or serum as they called it at the time and got much, much better. If we go to the next slide, we see summary data from um, the 1918 flu pandemic. And the bottom line is, is that the mortality rate was 16% in people treated, 54 out of 336, and 37% in untreated people. So convalescent plasma has a long history it's been uh, repurposed many times, and as the next slide, slide shows, uh, that it works. Uh, it, there's many examples of prophylaxis. Anybody out in the room who's ever had a, a hepatitis B or, or hepatitis A prophylaxis shot, uh, uh, rabies shots are another example of prophylaxis or antibody treatment. Um, uh, snake bite venom, antivenom is, is an antibody based. And the thing we know is that early use seems better. Uh, there are questions about rescue therapy. Does it work if you give it to people with COVID-19 who are really, really sick in the ICU? Who knows? And typically concentrated what's called hyperimmune globulin pooled products that are sort of the uh, uh, antibody equivalent of distilled products, uh, it, where, whereas plasma can be seen as the craft brewery, uh, follow uh, convalescent plasma. Next slide, please. So how did this happen uh, and how did it happen so quickly? I want to talk to you about my awareness of this. Basically, a friend of mine tweeted an article by another friend of mine that was in the Wall Street Journal. I attempted to raise awareness at Mayo. A network emerged. We engaged with the FDA. We developed the expanded access program. There are randomized clinical trials that are ongoing, and we'll talk a little bit about the results so far. Next slide, please. So this is what happened on February 27th. My good friend, Arturo Casavadal, uh, published an op-ed, How a Boy's Blood Stopped an Outbreak. Arturo is a friend of mine. Uh, next slide. I pinged Arturo and he sent me this article. In a threatened outbreak of measles in a prep school, on and on, on the basis of past experience, at least 25% of this group might have been expected to develop measles, and only a couple did uh, in this particular case report. We didn't have randomized clinical trials back in the 1930s, but this was certainly seen as very, very... Um, convincing. And apparently the Hill School in Pottstown, Pennsylvania is still open. Next slide. So awareness was raised at Mayo in early March after I started to interact with Arturo on this topic. Uh, the blood bank at Mayo had done this in the past on a boutique basis for infectious disease, especially in a couple of weird forms of infectious diseases with kids. And they told me immediately it could happen. Uh, and next slide, please. 
One of the most important things that no one said yes, but no one also said no. This The kibosh could have been put on this many, many times. A network formed around my colleague, Dr. Cass Vidal, Arturo at Hopkins. This includes Lisa Ann Porosky, uh, Nigel Panth from Michigan State, Jeff Henderson from WashU, who also is a graduate of Mayo High School, and Shmuel Shoham, an infectious disease doctor at, at uh, Hopkins. The Hopkins group was focused on prophylactic use in healthcare workers. In other words, they wanted to give high-risk people a shot of, of convalescent plasma to prevent disease. Uh, they had a protocol that was written by middle March and FDA and IND were, had been applied for. I repurposed my lab and uh, all the local ex experts I identified said yes. And next slide, please. So we began to um, think about a protocol at, at Mayo and our protocol was gonna focus on treatment of people with moderately severe uh, COVID who were not yet in the ICU. While all this was going on, we began to have dialogue with uh, CBRET at the FDA. Uh, in late um, March, they developed an EIND program for compassionate use. And on 3.30 of, of, of a couple months ago, they contacted me and said, can you review this uh, expanded access protocol that we've developed? I said, yes. The FDA, believe it or not, doesn't have their own IRB. And they said, uh, what do you think about an IRB? So I uh, emailed Dr. Scott Wright, the senior chair of the IRBs at Mayo Clinic. And Scott agreed that Mayo could not only be the IRB, but be a national IRB for the entire project. Next slide, please. Uh, so in late March, again, lots of action nationally. This is the uh, first use of the product in the United States at Houston Methodist, uh, based on the EIND Mount Sinai. May have used it at exactly the same time, number one hour later. And the national blood banking community uh, started to get mobilized. About 36,000 units of red blood cells are collected every day, plus many, many more units of platelets and other factors. So I knew that the blood banking infrastructure was quite large, and that was my main contribution to this, or at least what stimulated me to pursue this. As a result, if you go to the next slide, on the 1st of April, Mayo IRB approved expanded access protocol, uh, agreed that we would serve as the central IRB. We had concurrent website development, which allowed for site, physician, and patient enrollment. We had a workflow of what people needed to do and, and how we would coordinate this with the blood banks. We had navigator functions and frequently asked questions functions and case report tools. Uh, it rolled out on the 3rd of April. Next slide, please. And this is what it looks like. And that's just uh, the title. We've had a couple of updates since then because uh, we've changed the protocol a bit because we've, we're, we're attempting to build a plane while we're flying it. Next uh, slide. So we have currently about 21 locations, all 50 states in Puerto Rico plus the Pacific Islands. In fact, I just had a text from somebody who is going to be using it either in Fairbanks or Anchorage, Alaska uh, later today. Next slide. So on day zero, we had just a few sites. On day 24, we had a lot more sites and this is our 2000. Uh, next slide. So what have we learned so far? The United States government and the Mayo Clinic can move fast. Our first problem was there was not enough plasma that's currently been addressed and we, we no longer have a, a supplies meeting demand, although demand may be increasing. Uh, the early safety data, which we published, uh, or at least posted on a preprint uh, server yesterday with 5,000 patients suggests no major risk of plasma administration. We have incredible anecdotes. We're building out exposure or case control analysis. There are other uh, randomized uh, control trials, but I will predict that the preprint world will buzz soon with efficacy data and that will drive demand. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our 5,000 patients, cast 1,000. We posted this, uh, uh, got, got posted yesterday. Next slide. And the results are straightforward. The incidence of serious adverse events in the first four hours after transfusion was 1%, including a mortality rate of, of uh, three in 1,000. Of the 36 reported uh, serious adverse events, there were 25 reported incidents of related serious adverse events. These included mortality for transfusion associated circulatory overload, transfusion related acute lung injury and severe allergic transfusion reactions. But only two of these serious adverse events were judged as definitely related to the convalescent plasma uh, by the treating physician. So seven day mortality rate was 14.9%. Who knows what to make of this, but 18% of these people had um, multi-organ failure and about 15% uh, were septic. So uh, we were doing very, very well there. 
Uh, certainly the mortality rate is not alarming. And um, these uh, incidents of, of, of taco and trolley are quite low in the sense that it's also very, very difficult to make this diagnosis uh, in, in patients who are uh, in the intensive care unit. Next slide, please. So as of uh, this morning, we had 11,000 patients treated in, in about one month. The infrastructure and compliance framework took seven to 10 days to develop before the first patient was treated. Uh, we anticipate increased demand in the coming weeks and months and uh, demand will also increase so a defined product uh, can be made. So there's gonna be people wanting to get more plasma to treat patients now and people to get more plasma to make a so-called hyperimmune globulin. Next slide, please. So here's a case from our colleague, Bill Hartman, who used to be at Mayo now at University of Wisconsin. Good story. We had a relatively healthy 50-year-old guy on 60 liters of oxygen. That's a lot, um, an awful lot. Uh, they wanted to give him convalescent plasma, but he was delirious. So his brother was the, uh, the, the person who could say yes. And wanted, he wanted to think about it, the brother. So they had to intubate the guy and send him to the ICU. The brother then gave the okay. We transfused uh, and he was extubated 24 hours later. That's quite fast. And it's been weaned down to room air. We won on this guy. So we get a lot of examples like this. We get very few negative examples. We're building out the uh, analytics tools to look at efficacy. We know safety is good. So that gives us all cause for optimism. Next slide, please. But we are optimistic, but are we absolutely sure it's gonna work? No. And that's why we're waiting for uh, case control studies and randomized clinical trials to be completed. Thank you very much. It's amazing what, what looking back in history can teach us. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joyner. Thank and you. for everybody, please be sure to check out the National Convalescent Plasma Therapy website, linked in the video description below for more information. And with that, I'll close the second session for today. Thank you to all the teams who have presented. I'll pass the mic over to Neela Mogard, Executive Director of DEED, who will lead us into the third and final session. Over to you, Neela. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to everyone in the crowd watching on YouTube today. I'm Neela Mulgard, the Executive Director of Launch Minnesota. You heard earlier from Commissioner Grove, his leadership helped create Launch Minnesota, which is a new statewide collaborative effort to help accelerate startups and amplify Minnesota as a leader in innovation. It is my pleasure to introduce the third and final session focused on innovative and entrepreneurial Minnesotans stepping up to solve problems for their communities. From working to improve the patient experience in a hospital setting to making sure that the food and medication are accessible to those who need it. The first presenter for this session is Dr. Brian Crone from safedistance.org, who will be, tell us about his team's interesting approach to empowering individuals in their communities to know their exposure risk and make the best decisions for their safety. I'd like to remind Q Rounds that they're up after this presentation. In the meantime, take it away, Brian. Hi, thank you, Neela. Uh, my name is Brian Crone, and our project is Safe Distance. Uh, Safe Distance uses the neighborhood approach to detect, predict, and prevent the spread of COVID. Now, we all know that uh, symptom tracking and social distancing are currently our best tools to reduce the impact of COVID. Um, and we also know that there are uh, lots of different ways to implement symptom tracking and social distancing. And there are also some trade-offs between the different approaches. Uh, for instance, we can track uh, uh, cases, uh, official cases on the state and national levels, um, but that doesn't, isn't particularly effective, but it does protect privacy. On the other hand, we can track cases at the individual level, usually through government uh, mandates and surveillance, but that brings up some pretty serious privacy concerns. So um, as an example, I have a very good friend who lives in China, and this is an Instagram post uh, where he showed that he, um, <laughs> he actually woke up one day and his apartment was locked from the outside, and then he was swabbed uh, twice a day by people in hazmat suits until he tested negative. Um, this is definitely a highly effective method, but it's not something we'll likely implement here in the US. So our approach, we call the neighborhood approach, uh, which we think is a more democratic uh, solution to these authoritarian tracking systems. So how it works is we focus on detection, prediction, and prevention, all while doing it anonymously. 
to detect, we ask users to fill out an anonymous health survey. That data is then aggregated to the neighborhood level. And a neighborhood level is technically a census block group or about a thousand people. You can see here, this is real crowdsource data where the red uh, shows users who are reporting confirmed cases, orange reports are users who are reporting symptoms, and yellow are people who have been exposed or think they've been exposed to COVID. Again, we uh, maintain privacy, and so we don't track individual user paths, but we can tell when one user moves from one neighborhood to another. For example, this user, highlighted in yellow, has reported that they have symptoms, and yet they're moving around the Twin Cities quite a bit. Um, so tracking users and their movement from neighborhood to neighborhood can help us predict uh, where COVID will spread next. If we zoom out to the state level, our crowdsource data could help identify hotspots where symptoms are being reported, but official cases aren't confirmed yet. Um, for instance, these areas in Northern Minnesota um, are potential hotspots. Uh, for prevention, uh, we make it as useful uh, to the user as possible. So we include a personalized risk assessment as well as social distancing recommendations uh, based on the user's health survey. We also have a neighborhood level risk map, which pulls in our crowdsource data, but we also use a variety of other data sets uh, to give the user a, a full risk uh, assessment, a full risk map, um, so that they can make the best decisions about where and when to move around in their community. We can also send the users uh, notifications if they're moving into, say, a higher risk neighborhood, or if they're a high risk individual and likely they should be staying put. So to summarize, uh, safe distance is a high resolution risk map so that the users can make informed decisions. It provides personalized recommendations for users so they can take clear action. And it's a method for public officials to detect and predict uh, COVID outbreaks while maintaining user privacy. Our team uh, is led by Bjorn Westgard. He's our medical lead at Health Partners Institute, as well as Tim Smith at the University of Minnesota is our lead researcher and I'm our lead technologist uh, at Modern Logic. Uh, this has been a primarily a volunteer effort, so we're thankful for everyone who has contributed. Uh, it's been really amazing to work with everyone. Um, and what we're looking for for you to help is you can go to our site, safedistance.org, download the app, try it out, share it with your friends. Um, we're also looking for funding opportunities, donations. You can do that at safedistance.org uh, donate. And importantly, we're looking for connections, Neela, to uh, state uh, offices like DEED, as well as uh, the Department of Health. So feel free to reach out at safedistance.org slash contact. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. The solution seems like it will really allow us to find a good balance between the safety and the privacy, and that's super exciting. As hospitals visits are becoming more and more a reality for our families all over Minnesota and around the world, Dr. Michael Pitt and his colleague, Dr. John Satori, are striving to reimagine the patient experience, starting with hospital wait times. They've called this their innovation solution Q Rounds. Let's hear more about it. I'd like to remind Roundtable Rx that they are up next. Go ahead, Dr. Pitt. Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Mike Pitt. I'm a pediatrician at the University of Minnesota, and I'd love to tell you about our project Q Rounds, which is a virtual queue for inpatient medical rounds, and we're aimed at decreasing uncertainty, increasing patient satisfaction, and increasing efficiency. And I'll share some really unique spin we've had on this in the COVID era. We'll go back one slide. So if anybody has been in the hospital or has been a, a loved one of someone in the hospital, you know full well that a hospital room is a waiting room. So you might be in there for 24 hours, but often you're waiting 23 hours and 50 minutes for the next time that your team of doctors is there for rounds. Um, that can be a frustrating experience. It can be an anxiety provoking experience. And that's true for all the stakeholders in the hospital system. So patients tell us that when their family members in the hospital, they feel powerless. And their main connection is to understanding uh, what's going on is during that round. Well, as you know, COVID has caused visitor restrictions that are making that even harder for patients to connect. Families have to surrender their entire days, whether they can go to the bathroom, have a, a, a cup of coffee, attend a work meeting, trying to latch onto the team from doctors during that time for rounds. This is true for nurses too, 
who have multiple patients with multiple teams rounding on them and can't plan their days to be effective without knowing when to expect the team of doctors. In fact, nurses tell us the most common question they are asked during the day by patients is when will my doctor be here for rounds? And that's a question we as doctors very rarely empower them to answer well. And as a provider, when I arrive to the room, it's not uncommon for the family to not be there or for the patient to be at a procedure. And I know that creates more work for me later to catch up. Certainly COVID visitor restrictions have made that even more challenging when the family may not be allowed to be in the room. So at QRounds, we believe time is power. And in order for time to be power, we have to provide time transparency to empower patients and providers with real-time connections to inpatient rounds. So we do this pretty simply. We provide real-time text updates on when to expect your provider for rounds. So when you go to do a return at Ikea, you take a number, you know when it's your turn. When you go to the deli, you know it's in your turn. Meanwhile, you're held hostage in a hospital room. We wanna empower you with when to expect your team. So you can see here a text, your doctors have started rounding, you're scheduled to be seen third. They should arrive between 9.50 and 10.20. Click here to invite others to receive updates on when rounds will, be, uh, will start and click here to invite them to a video link for when rounds begin. So now during the COVID era, when families are not able to be at the bedside often for their patients, they can join rounds virtually with a click of a button, notified that rounds have started and join. In fact, our first pilot uh, go live this week, uh, the first patient to use this was a family living in Duluth, 175 miles away, joining their doctors and their baby in the NICU uh, uh, and an incubator in the NICU, the medical student who'd been working from home because they're not allowed to be back in the hospital was able to be there with the family as well as the medical team with one click. This is what our suite looks like and we're working on uh, continuing to add uh, uh, capabilities to kind of simplify both the nurses, uh, interpreters, uh, uh, families and, and their loved ones for being able to be on rounds and know when to expect that team in real time. Our customer is the hospital. So we know that 91% of hospital systems use patient rounding technology but none of these systems provide real updates on the timing of rounds. And that's what we aim to do with QRounds is that time transparency. So far, we've done this all with grant support. What we're looking for is $50,000 would allow us to expand the ability to do this in Minnesota, getting more families connected instantly to their uh, uh, patients during rounds in real time. We're in the pilot testing stage. Like I said, we started this with a, a, a rapid response grant at, at the Masonic this last week and are uh, looking to roll out across Fairview over the next few weeks. Um, I'm Mike Pitt. I'm the founder and CEO of this project and my colleague, John Sartori is our chief technical officer and we thank you for the time. Thank you, Michael. It sounds like the solution has real potential to improve the patient experience. Um, speaking of patient experience, as social distancing and COVID-19 exposure continues to make it harder and harder to get medication to at-risk patients, Dr. Rowan Mahone and her nonprofit organization, Roundtable Outlook, are working to form the first medicinal repository. Let's hear more about her mission. But first, a quick reminder to Sprout MN, you're up next. Take it away, Rowan. Hi, everyone. I'm Rowan Mann. I am a pharmacist and a founder of Roundtable RX, Minnesota's medication matchmaker. Before COVID-19 even happened, it was estimated that 1.4 million Minnesotans were struggling to pay for their medications. And when patients are struggling to pay for their medications, one of two things is generally gonna happen. They're either gonna stop taking their medications completely, or they're going to try to ration them out so that they can last longer. And when patients don't take their medications as prescribed, it can end up costing the healthcare system billions of dollars in avoidable cost. It can cause um, more hospitalizations, more ER visits, and it in the end just causes worse healthcare outcomes for everyone involved. Now COVID-19 has happened and 400, 000, over 400,000 Minnesotans have been laid off. And in this country, um, employment is linked to healthcare insurance. So many of these individuals will be losing their healthcare insurance and then being able to afford their medications is gonna be much more difficult and it's just going to exasperate this already serious problem. At the same time, long-term care facilities are wasting tons of medications every year. It's estimated up to that they're it's estimated that they waste up to $16 million of safe medications every year. In long-term care facilities, they prepackage their medications in 14 to 30-day bubble packs, like pictured on the slide. 
And if not all those medications in that bubble pack get used, then they can't always be returned back to the pharmacy and they have to be destroyed through incineration, which is expensive, or through flushing them down the drain, which is bad for our water supply. So at, during this time of COVID-19, when medication shortages are here and more medication shortages are coming, we really need to not be wasting safe, not expired medications. And this is where Roundtable RX comes in. Roundtable RX is a medication repository. Medication repositories allow for these long-term care facilities to donate these medications to patients in need. The way it's going to work in Minnesota is long-term care facilities can donate their medications to Roundtable RX. And at Roundtable RX, we will have a licensed pharmacist do the safety checks that are needed on these medications. And from there, they can be sent to dispensing pharmacies or they can be sent directly to the patients themselves through a mail order. We've been working to build Roundtable RX for quite a while. In 2016, I began studying medication repositories. And in 2017, I began working on the legislation that's needed for a repository to exist in the state of Minnesota. In 2019, Governor Tim Waltz signed um, the medication repository legislation into law. Since then, we've been working on the business Roundtable RX. Um, we are hoping to open our doors at the end of May or the very beginning of June, and we're hoping by the fourth quarter of 2020 to have served over 4,000 patients and to redistribute um, and eliminate 10,000 um, pounds of pharmaceutical waste. Our team that's been together for three years, um, we have two PharmDs with Masters of Public Health, one pharmacy student, and one Carlson School MBA graduate. We created, led, and then passed the medication repository legislation. And during that time, we became medication repository experts. We have studied pharmacy, the Minnesota healthcare ecosystem, and related state and federal legislation. On top of all this, we have an outstanding board of directors supporting us from the University of Minnesota, Fairview Health, federally qualified healthcare centers, which represent charitable pharmacies and clinics, and multiple pharmacy and public health organizations. Today, we are here to ask for help with fundraising. Um, we are looking to raise 135,000 for the first six months of operations. This will mainly help us with staffing and it will help us with some go live equipment and the education and outreach needed to make sure that we're connecting with those long-term care facilities and clinics. Um, we are also always looking for more healthcare organizations and to have those connections in there. And we also have three positions available on our board of directors and we would love some recommendations on them. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for allowing us to present here and for hearing our mission. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Wow, solving medical waste while increasing access to medication is fantastic. Great job. Up next, we have Arlen Jones and Fallon Ryan uh, from Sprout, Minnesota another nonprofit whose goal is to support small local family farms by acting as a food hub for central Minnesota's rural residents. Reminder to mo mobility for all uh, that you're up next. Arlene, uh, tell us more about what you do at Sprout. Well, hello everybody. This has been absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm incredibly um, just humbled by what's going on out there. I'm Arlene Jones, the executive director of a nonprofit food hub in Little Falls, whose work is to move local foods from the field um, to the plate. And I'm Fallon Ryan. I am the engagement coordinator for Sprout. So in the, go back one slide, Fallon, please. Oh, yep, can we go back a slide, please? All right. There we go. Thank you. The COVID-19 challenge for a food hub is that we are addressing uh, food insecurity in rural Minnesota with a significant aging population who also face additional barriers of being homebound and or a lack of transportation. In the face of this global pandemic, growers are also continuing to experience the uncertainty of markets returning. And this is exacerbated by the general public's willingness to risk exposure. And I expect we'll see a lot of this happening uh, this year at farmers markets and other places where the general public is um, not willing to gather. Our five county area demographics include 37% of our total population over the age of 55. During this pandemic, we've seen an exponential increase in those that are becoming more food insecure, 
with an inability to leave their homes due to underlying health conditions or out of fear for their own safety as the population who is the most at risk and vulnerable to recovery. Food access is a key determinant of health and a basic necessity. Sprout staff are dedicated to the founding mission, which you can see on the slide. And during our seven years of operation, we have not wavered from this. Oh, see. Sprout is working on creating innovative programs that provide our citizens both food security and impact the bottom line of our small family farms. Keeping our growers on their land and in food production while nutritionally supporting our vulnerable populations. Together, farmers, food justice activists, public health, food banks, community mental health are all part of the dedicated teams that form the community of Sprout. Sprout is equipped with a mobile grocery store on wheels with refrigeration and grocery or refrigeration and freezer capacity and ready to be stocked with locally grown and nutritious fruits, vegetables, dairy, and meats while pivoting to home delivery, a home delivery service during a pandemic crisis. This is an innovative twist to move the dial and access to nutrition with integrated community support systems while maintaining personal and community safety standards. There is also value in understanding the unique ability of small food to be nimble and adapt to unforeseen and unprecedented crisis. Oh, well, I apparently have lost the slide for our team. Um, so you ask why now and why here and how are we gonna make this happen? Sprout is led by a dedicated team of food justice activists that are dedicated to moving food from the fields to our most vulnerable populations. Um, we are working with, like we said, community mental health practitioners, long-term care facilities, and other community activists to uh, develop a very innovative model to move food through our systems, uh, through this innovative CSA model and into uh, the homes of our long-term care, assisted living and homebound um, residents uh, through our mobile market, which typically goes out and sets up mobile markets in food deserts or with low access. And what we are looking to do is actually change that model to keep our vulnerable elderly residents safe and to still provide them with food access. We are asking for financial support, the dollars necessary to fund an initiative that feeds people, keeps them safe, and supports small family farms. How do we know we will be effective? We have human resources, skilled staff, strong community partnerships, and experience. We have established infrastructure, a licensed facility, and delivery capability. And we have a long-standing history of success. So. Thank you. We're asking for your donations as a nonprofit to follow the link and provide the support needed for this project financially. We're asking you to share it with your networks and your partnerships. Please reach out to Fallon or I at the email addresses listed below. We wanna thank you for your time and consideration. We want you to remember that food is medicine in this lovely afternoon of how people are just going above and beyond to address this incredible um, world that we're living in. And remember that your donation is tax deductible. And above all else, we want you to buy from your local farmer, support your small family farms, be well and stay safe. Thank you Sprout Minnesota for all you're doing in our community. Make sure to reach out to them if you're interested in finding out more. All contact information can be found in the video descriptions below. To close out the session, I'm happy to welcome Mobility for All, a personalized ride service for at-risk and underserved populations throughout Minneapolis. John Doan and his team have been making great progress over the last year, and we can't wait to see all the big things that they have in store for us. Take it away, John. Thank you, Neela. And hi all, did you know that social isolation is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day? So over the last two months of social distancing, I'm guessing that we've all smoked at least a dozen cartons of cigarettes. Well, prior to COVID, senior social isolation was our grand challenge. 
I'm John Doan, co-founder and CEO of Mobility for All, or MO for short. We are the personalized ride service for seniors. We empower seniors to live independently and more full lives. Our B2B strategy targets long-term care facilities as our customers. We currently have 22 senior communities in the Twin Cities uh, that we work with. They represent, along with the over uh, 50,000 senior communities in the United States, a $5 billion total addressable market that is woefully underserved. When COVID hit Minnesota, we knew it was bad news. The worst news that a CEO can get is that nearly 80% of the COVID deaths are hitting their customers. Pre-COVID, we were on the startup Golden Brick Road with 35% uh, month over month revenue growth and 40% ridership growth, as you can see by those two charts. In March, our daily ridership fell by 60%. Before we were on that path to profitability, because at 2,000 rides, which is our magic number, our break-even point uh, for revenue and for rides, we were going to hit that in July of this year. Not only was COVID hurting our customers, it th it's threatening our economy and our business. So what does one do? We pivoted and doubled down on our B2B relationships with senior living communities because long-term, that demand is strong and near term, they need our help. We continue to provide essential medical rides and added food and prescription deliveries. In April, we did over 217 grocery and prescription orders, 35 supply runs for Meals on Wheels and 295 food shelf box deliveries for seniors in need. Without even counting these deliveries, our social return on investment is 164% as assessed by a third party evaluator. We plan to expand to Rochester later this year and then to two new national markets next year. Plus, we're partnering with Lyft on a three year government contract for a paratransit in the Twin Cities. We have a diverse and seasoned leadership team. If you add that to our advisors, who you see here, we are at over 250 years of experience. This positions us to transform and disrupt the senior mobility market. My double bottom line ask for you all listening today is first and foremost, to donate rides to low-income seniors through forgiving.com. Our code is 428C. Plus, we have a state grant that matches dollar for dollar what you donate today. Secondly, for accredited investors, we're doing a million dollar seed round raise to accelerate our growth and profitability. Join Chase, Ford Fund, and the Carlson Family Foundation, as well as many others who have provided us with over half a million dollars of non-dilutive pre-seed funding already. Invest in Mo because we have built this platform for our parents who lost their sight and depend on others for a ride. Invest in Mo because life is about enjoying the ride. Hey, you can find me at john at mobilityforall.com. And it's a gorgeous Friday afternoon outside. And I hear that my uh, drink is waiting for me on the porch. So I'm going to bid you adieu and head out. See you guys. Thank you, John. That was wonderful. Enjoy your beverage and, and for your work taking care of our community. Um, it's been fantastic to see how your team is succeeding. And with that, I'd like to close out our last session. It's been an honor moderating this session and I hope you all enjoyed our time together learning from our inspiring innovators today. Mary, it's, it's, uh, I'm passing it off to you. It's all yours. Yep, St Steve and I will close it the last one minute here. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Steve, Neela, uh, Rockstar Laura, Rockstar and Stefan. Um, it's been fun, you guys are, amazing and I'm proud to be from Minnesota. Steve? Next slide, Laura. Uh, um, just, uh, a quick um, uh, commercial here for the uh, uh, Minnesota Venture Builder Program. These programs are free and they're often 
open to entrepreneurs across the state. Um, feel free to go to the Carlson School uh, link here under more info to sign up and you'll learn about the value proposition, product market fit, and collecting uh, information on customers. Um, it's a really powerful class and a uh, series of classes and I've been through them all. It's so great to see those classes rolling out. Uh, just for a reminder for everybody that um, the hopefully the next normal walleye tank, um, which is the ice fishing edition in 2020, yeah, is scheduled. Please mark your calendars. Uh, Friday, December 11th, it'll be uh, in Rochester, Minnesota. And next slide, please. I want to thank everybody for your engagement today in your event and all, your support for all of these innovators. Um, uh, we have a phrase that it takes a village to raise a startup and, it and uh, we've been able to, I think, I hope, expand that village to include all of the audience, uh, whether you can do donations or are we funder or just giving uh, deep support and sharing all of these wonderful stories uh, you saw today. So stay safe and thank you from all of us um, and Sven the walleye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you.